On June 5, 1976, in Union, Kentucky, Dr. Gaines Huey, a dentist from Walton, left for work as usual. Driving down Chambers Road, something caught his eye. A lifeless body of a teenage girl by the roadside, next to a culvert. Kentucky State Police were called. At around 7.15 a.m., Trooper Jan Washner and his team from the Walton State Police Department reached the scene. The victim's body had numerous cuts and bruises, but the biggest injury was to the head. The detectives also discovered deep strangulation marks around the neck. They examined the crime scene, discovering broken twigs and flattened grass. It was clear the body was dragged here. There was no blood splatter on the crime scene. The crime happened somewhere else. This was just the dumping ground. The culprit did not bother to hide the body at all. It was left in plain sight, as if he wanted it to be found. Investigators combed the area, but they could not find the lethal weapon, fingerprints, or any other clues. With no witnesses or concrete evidence, Detective Wushner had no leads to follow. With the crime scene investigation yielding no results, investigators turned to the victim's body for answers. Her body was sent to the county's medical examiner's lab for an autopsy. The results of the autopsy revealed she had suffered a vicious assault. A tire iron was used as a weapon with extreme force. Disfigured by extensive bruising and swelling, the victim's face was nearly unrecognizable. A deep laceration on her head was evident. The signs of genital abuse and brutal physical trauma were clear. The cause was determined to be blunt force trauma to the head and asphyxiation by manual strangulation. When all hope was lost, the forensic team made a breakthrough. They discovered foreign DNA on the victim's clothing. But when they ran the DNA sample through the central database, no match was found. With no further leads, the case file started gathering dust and went cold. The girl whose life was ended so brutally was just 16 years old. She was identified as Carol Sue Kleber. Carol Sue Kleber, born and raised in Boone County, Kentucky, came into this world in 1960. She attended Dixie Heights High School, where she was a senior. Carol Sue was known not just as a good student, but for her passion for music. She played the piano and violin. She was deeply involved in the school's band, which became a significant part of her life. Carol was more than just a student and a musician. She was also a loving sister. She had a close relationship with her brothers, Charles and Thomas Kleber. Carol Sue was only 10 when her father passed away due to heart failure. Carol Sue led a very normal life in a quiet town, but what truly set Carol Sue apart were her frequent visits to DeVal Park in western Covington, Kentucky. In an era when communication relied on face-to-face -face interactions, DeVal Park was her sanctuary, her place to unwind, her hub for socializing. Here, she enjoyed riding her bike and engaging in heart-to-heart -heart conversations with friends. Carol's charismatic and outgoing nature made her a popular figure among her friends whom she met at DeVal Park. At around 5.30 p.m. on June 4th, she took a bike ride to the park. The plan was to meet friends for dinner at Z's Hyde Park restaurant. But rather than spending time with her friends, witnesses at the park observed her talking to a stranger. He was approximately 5 foot 10 inches with a slender build and sandy blonde shoulder-length hair. He drove an impressive Pontiac Grand Prix or a Chevy Monte Carlo. They both left the park together. She was seen putting her bicycle into the trunk of the man's car. The man then drove her to her home where her neighbors saw her taking the bicycle out of the car. She went inside, 
but the car did not leave right away. It stood there idling in the driveway. A few minutes later, Carol Sue came back out with a change of clothes and left with this same man. This was the last time she was seen alive. When her family reported her missing, the police informed them of a body they had discovered, bearing a striking resemblance to Carol Sue. Her brother Thomas bravely stepped into the morgue to confirm the unimaginable truth. It was indeed Carol Sue. As days turned into years, the case of Carol Sue remained unsolved and eventually went cold. With each passing moment, her family and friends could only yearn for the answers and closure that remained agonizingly out of reach. After years of silence, a glimmer of hope appeared in Carol Sue's execution. In 2017, two cold case detectives, Coy Cox and Tina Adams, reopened the case. They teamed up with the original detective, Jerry Keith, who has since retired but was an expert on the Carol Sue case. Together, this trio began to revisit the case file page by page, looking for clues with a new perspective. Cox and Adams began their search, re-examining two suspects Keith had previously identified. The first lead was of a man with a history of car theft, matching the description of Carol's last seen vehicle. They tracked him down and questioned him. Despite his criminal past, the man was surprisingly cooperative. He did not hide behind a lawyer, but he vehemently denied any role in Carol's slaying. He understood his prior wrongdoings made him a suspect, but he stood firm on his innocence in Carol's incident. Cox and Adams asked for a DNA test, and he willingly provided the sample. After a long wait, the results came back in December 2018. The foreign DNA found on the girl's clothing did not match his DNA. He was not the perpetrator. With their initial suspect eliminated, Cox and Adams shifted their focus to the second suspect in 2020. Their attention honed in on an unknown assailant who had committed a similar crime in the same vicinity just two years after Carol's body was discovered on the 1st of October 1978. The only difference is the victim is still alive. The investigators reached out to the victim of the October 1st, 1978 crime. She recounted the chilling events of that fateful night. It was a dark and quiet evening in Park Hills, Kentucky, when she was ambushed in her garage. A man appeared out of nowhere, suddenly grabbing her from behind. What followed was a traumatic ordeal that stretched for two agonizing hours. She was tortured and brutally assaulted. First, he had his way with her. Then, the attacker burnt her with a cigarette and relentlessly hit her to keep her subdued. Cox meticulously combed through the archives, carefully reconstructing the evidence. His efforts paid off when he uncovered a critical fingerprint on the victim's car. They ran the fingerprints through their system and, to their surprise, found a match. The attacker was Michael Dean Tate. He was now 77 years old. With this discovery, Michael Dean Tate was arrested for similarly assaulting a woman in 1978. Also, Cox and Adams were now breathing down his neck as a potential suspect in the Carol Sue case. Tate was a frequent traveler to Kentucky for work during the 70s and 80s. He had a questionable past, but he too adamantly refused any involvement in the slaying. Detectives were confident that they had finally found the man responsible, but their optimism fell to pieces as the DNA found on Carol did not match Tate's. Also, court records firmly placed Tate in Cincinnati in 1976, leaving the detectives once again at square one. This decades-old mystery continued to slip through their grasp. In September 2022, 
Detectives Cox and Adams sought help from Othram Labs, a private company with a unique knack for solving the unsolvable. Othram Labs helps police figure out how people are related to each other, even if they are not very closely related. They do this by using special tests on DNA, which look at short tandem repeats, which are like little patterns in the DNA, and single nucleotide polymorphisms, which are tiny changes in the DNA. Using their expertise, the police can determine who the assailant might be related to by using DNA. This task was given to Othram Labs in September 2022. After securing funding, it took less than two months. By November 2022, Othram Labs came back with the results. Through the DNA samples left by the perpetrator, a genetic link was identified. He is Thomas Dunaway. The catch was, Thomas Dunaway had already passed away in 1990. This means the police could not test his DNA for a direct match. But he had a child who grew up never knowing his father. This discovery would become the key to unlocking the mystery. Detectives traveled to meet Mr. Dunaway's biological son to collect DNA samples for comparison. When the DNA of Dunaway's son was compared with foreign DNA found 46 years ago in Carol Sue's clothing, the lab came out with an astonishing result. In December 2022, almost 46 years after the crime, Justice would finally be served for Carol Sue Kleber and her family. The DNA results proved with 100% certainty that the man they were looking for was indeed Thomas W. Dunaway. Thomas W. Dunaway was 19 years old when he ended the life of Carol Sue. He managed to evade justice for decades, but the tireless efforts of the police eventually caught up to him. Now that they had a name, detectives could delve deep into his past life and the crimes he committed. They found more evidence that he lived near Deval Park. This was where Carol Sue was last seen with a man resembling Dunaway. As they delved deeper, they found more incriminating evidence. Thomas W. Dunaway was not just a one-time offender. He went on a six-month crime spree, committing crimes and ditching the cars he used. His criminal streak did not stop after the demise of Carol Sue Kleber. He was also convicted of taking the life of another person in Boone County just six months after Carol Sue's tragic end. On a December night in 1976, 19-year-old Ronald Townsend was found lying on the ground, riddled with bullets. He was severely injured and taken to the hospital. Four days later, he succumbed to his injuries, leaving behind a grieving family. Dunaway had a pattern of committing crimes and abandoning the cars he used to flee the scenes. His love for cars led detectives to his doorstep. In May 1976, Dunaway bought a two-tone 1973 Chevrolet Monte Carlo. It was the same car in which he picked up Carol Sue at the park. After Carol Sue slaying, he exchanged it for an orange Chevrolet Vega. He left Union, Kentucky and took refuge in Fort Carson. This car swap enabled him to shield himself from Carol Sue's case. But when he shot Ronald Townsend, it was the orange Vega he was driving. Nobody saw who the shooter was, but many witnesses saw the orange Vega he drove off in. The detective issued an attempt to locate for his very prominent orange Vega. This chase culminated in his arrest on Christmas Eve in 1976 in South Carolina, where he faced charges of setting someone else's car on fire and possessing an illegal firearm. He confessed and pled guilty, receiving a life sentence. Unfortunately, his sentence was cut short, and Dunaway was released early on parole in 1984, 
after serving only seven and a half years behind bars. The gruesome slayings of Carol Sue and Ronald Townsend had disturbing similarities. Both victims were blatantly left in plain sight near the road, almost as if it were a taunt directed at the authorities. It was as if the assailant wanted to send a message. In both cases, nobody saw the actual man responsible, but many saw his flashy car. A deeper investigation revealed that Dunaway was not just a person of interest for the police, but someone else was also looking for him, the United States Army. Interestingly, Dunaway enlisted in the Army just nine days after he took Carol Sue's life. He was initially stationed at Fort Knox, but then transferred to Fort Carson, Colorado. Thomas Dunaway served the Army for just six months and went AWOL after he took the life of Townsend. The connection between Carol Sue Kleber and Thomas Dunaway remains a mystery. All detectives had were theories. There was no concrete evidence as to how they both knew each other. There was a possibility that they were childhood friends or schoolmates in the Erlinger Ellesmere Schools District, as they both attended the same schools. But if that would have been the case, someone would have identified Dunaway at the park. Detective Cox believes that Devau Park holds a crucial clue. Carol was known for her social nature, and it is possible she met Dunaway there for the first time. Maybe she went on her first date with Dunaway that evening. Detectives had concrete DNA evidence against Dunaway, which would have been enough to charge him with the execution of Carol Sue had he still been alive. Yet still, Detective Cox obtained a court order to exhume the body of Dunaway, which was buried in 1990. Not only did this allow for a direct DNA sample to be collected for the Carol Sue case, but more importantly, it would be entered into the combined DNA index system that could link his DNA to other unsolved crimes. Although justice may not have been fully served, the revelation of Dunaway's identity brought some closure to the case. Dunaway's history, his criminal activities, and his release from prison in 1984 raise valid concerns about the true extent of justice served. While there is a degree of closure, it accentuates the complex nature of the criminal justice system. In 1979, an unidentified woman's body was found in a state park, a case unsolved for decades. It was not until 2023 that significant developments including advances in forensic technology and cross-state collaboration, shed new light on the long-standing mystery, and the person who attacked her was brought to justice. It was September 28, 1979. A woman's body was discovered at Sugar Pine Point State Park campground on Lake Tahoe. She appeared badly beaten and bruised and appeared to have been strangled. In her early 30s, she had some jewelry on her body. She had some rings, a wristwatch, and a deer pendant. The three people who discovered her body did not immediately call the police. Instead, they called a local newspaper and snuck off. The reporter then informed law enforcement authorities. Police found that the three men had not called their discovery in because they had warrants out for arrest. They were all cleared for this specific crime. An autopsy, shockingly, would reveal that the Jane Doe was likely alive when they discovered her. It appeared that she had been assaulted, and so an SA kit test was conducted on her body. These kits have collection bags, microscopic slides, a comb, sterile containers, etc. to collect evidence. Hairs, saliva, blood, and other bodily fluids are lifted off victims with the help of these kits to prove assault and identify the perpetrator. She was found to have suffered severe blows to her body, and there were defensive wounds that indicated she fought back. 
there were multiple signs of struggle around the picnic area of the western shore of the lake, and the victim lost one of her flip-flops while trying to escape her assailant. Investigating officers recovered very little evidence, but unknowingly bagged one important item, an empty beer bottle they found near the body. Back in 1979, forensic technology was not as advanced as it is today. The evidence was filed away and the body was stored in the morgue for a long, long time. Nobody came forward to claim the unknown woman, and so it was decided to bury her in an anonymous grave in a potter's field located in El Dorado County. Lake Tahoe has always been a popular tourist destination and was so back then as well. The beaches and campsites always attract people from all over, and it was hard to trace this woman. She could be from anywhere. At the time, police did not recover a vehicle or any other belongings, so there was no way of knowing who she was and how she got there. Limited by technology, it was considered a cold case and was taken off priority. Years later, when DNA testing came out in 1986, the DNA lifted off the beer bottle and the victim were analyzed. It was clear the bottle belonged to the assailant, but there was no further progress until decades later. Almost 36 years later, investigating officer John Gaines took over this case in 2014. He reopened the Lake Tahoe Jane Doe's files. It was a part of the El Dorado County's Cold Case Unit, opening cases from the 1970s, 80s, and 90s. In the Lake Tahoe Jane Doe case, he exhumed the body. Accompanied by a forensic anthropologist from California State University, Chico, he printed photos of her jewelry to be released to the public in an attempt to identify her. The pictures were published in local newspapers without many leads. Gain noticed the necklace and realized the deer necklace was actually a high pendant, which represents the Jewish symbol for life. He said it was the kind of pendant Elvis Presley used to wear on stage. With the high pendant as a lead, Gaines tried his luck with the local Jewish community. Lake Tahoe's local rabbi, Rabbi Morty Rickler, who had opened a Chabad, was surprised to have officers contact him. A Chabad is considered a Jewish community center, and one does not often come across police in these centers. It is a holy place of peace and sanctity. When they explained the case, Rabbi Rickler was happy to help and spread the word in the community. In 1979, when the body was discovered, the Jewish community was just settling in the Lake Tahoe area, with very few families. Now the area had two synagogues and over 1,000 Jewish members. In September 2015, Rabbi Yossi Grossbaum had a visit from three detectives, in plain clothes but with guns and badges. Gaines had reached the city of Folsom, California, in an attempt to connect with any surviving relatives of the victim. Rabbi Grossbaum spread the word in Northern California and throughout the state. One family finally came forward after identifying the pendant in the newspapers. A DNA test was conducted on the remains and the alleged victim's daughter, and there was a match. The body was then finally identified as Patricia Carnahan, who would have been 35 years old at the time that she lost her life. Originally from Virginia, Patricia had gone off on a solo road trip around California. She was driving a red Volkswagen bus. She had contacted her family to tell them she was on her way back home, but never arrived. A month later, in October of 1979, the family reported her missing. Her car was recovered from a dealership in Venice, California. Apparently, someone had abandoned the car in the lot. Unfortunately, she was a missing persons case in Virginia, so no connection was made. Additionally, Patricia's DNA profile was uploaded into CODIS, FBI's combined DNA system, 
as well as the DNA from the perpetrator. But for many more years, there was no match. Her body was then handed over to the family for a proper burial, and she was laid to rest 26 years after her unfortunate demise. The perpetrator, however, remained free. Years later, a completely unrelated chain of events led to the arrest of the assailant. In 2023, the state of Washington provided funding to the Washington State SA Kit Initiative, a movement aimed at reopening abuse probe tests from the 70s onwards in an attempt to put the perpetrators behind bars. The Spokane Police Department was one of the few that had officers assigned to work full-time on abuse probe test cases. The SPD had over 1,500 kits, and among those, over 250 kits got matches on the combined DNA index system. This led to a huge breakthrough. In 1994, a man had been accused of having his way with a homeless woman in Spokane. She reported the incident to the police, got tested for verification of her accusation, and identified her assailant as a man named Harold Carpenter. He was booked on second-degree charges for forcing her against her will, but never prosecuted because the woman did not press charges. Harold Carpenter claimed that they had consensual relations and he did not defile her, so it was just his word against hers. The test kit had been filed away, but was now uploaded into CODIS. The woman who had logged the complaint had long since passed away. But the DNA on the system matched the DNA on the empty beer bottles and Patricia Carnahan's body. Further investigation placed Carpenter in the vicinity of the crime on September 29, 1979, when he was arrested in Susanville, California, for driving under the influence. Carpenter had various misdemeanor arrests between 1990 and 1993, as well as being charged for another non-consensual incident regarding a woman in 1994. He was married and lived in Sandpoint until his divorce in 1998, after she filed charges against him for domestic battery. There were charges against him from 1998 to 2018 in Bonner County for possession of illegal substances, reckless driving, more DUI, and disturbing the peace. There was not much on his record in Washington except one DUI in the year 2000. Carpenter was living on Spokane Street since 2016, rendered homeless. In 2018, he was arrested as a suspect in another non-consensual case in Spokane County, but it was not proven. He was quoted in an article published in The Inlander in 2020 regarding his homeless situation. You just tough it. You just go outside and you try to get out of the rain or the snow or whatever. In 2022, he was a suspect for a groping incident, but again, he was not arrested. He moved into Park Tower Apartments in downtown Spokane. Investigators of El Dorado County now had probable cause to arrest him, and Spokane Police Department helped in locating Carpenter. Thanks to multi-state agencies working together, the 63-year-old was brought to justice when he was arrested on March 1, 2023 for taking the life of Patricia Carnahan. Due to the statute of limitations, the Spokane case could not be pursued and there were no charges filed against him in that particular case. He is currently held without bond in Spokane County Jail awaiting extradition process for El Dorado so he can be prosecuted for his crimes. The decades-long cold case was finally cracked. Patricia Carnahan's assailant has been identified 44 years later, thanks to advances in forensic technology and agencies working together across states. The mystery of the 1979 Lake Tahoe Jane Doe solved almost half a century later.